thank you for uh, thank all of you for being here i really have no idea what your expectations are but i am going to tell you a story i'm going to tell you a story i'm going to tell you a couple of more stories one one big story one small story this was this this happened way back in 2000 uh, the american president bill clinton was uh, supposed to come to uh, was expected on a state visit to india and uh, well delhi was getting all dressed up for him so was hyderabad because he had come to hyderabad too then chandra babu naidu was the chief minister he had come to hyderabad too so they all the big cities wherever he was going were all getting decked up roads were being laid and you know buildings were being spruced up in kashmir what a hundred people were in a gurudwara offering prayers and a group of people burst into the gurudwara took out their ak-47s and shot 30 of those people praying dead most of you probably would be would have been toddlers maybe some of you were not born then i don't know how old you are so what happened was we 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 all know how much uh, of a problem terrorism is in kashmir right and late 90s early 2000s were it was really at a peak i'm not going to get into the merits and demerits of uh, the government action the merits and demerits of the politics of it i'm not going to go into the merits and demerits of international relations that is not my idea here i'm just going to tell you a story about what happened there so 30 people were killed not a small thing and there were non muslims there were six bill clinton was supposed to come to hyder delhi in another week from that day indian government was under intense pressure they wanted to show the american government that pakistan does these things all the time pakistan is destabilizing kashmir Pakistan is destabilizing India. They needed to find those who killed those six. Four days later, four, yeah, five days later actually, the incident happened four days later. But five on the fifth day, the news came out. The Indian Army and the Jammu and Kashmir Police announced that they found five terrorists. who were responsible for the massacre of the six this happened in a village called chatti singh pura for the chatti singh pura massacre they found five of those who were responsible and these were terrorists so what do terrorists do when they come across security forces they take out their guns and start firing at them right at least that's what we are told so that's what happened the official narrative went that uh, five people were shot dead in a fire fight and it was a nasty long fire fight there were grenades thrown the whole shebang whatever you know the kind of a stuff you see in movies these days you know people seem to be playing with grenades like we used to play with marbles when Okay, so let me just take it out and pop. So, that was that. That was the end of the story as far as the security forces were concerned. Bill Clinton arrived after a couple of days and Indian government presented evidence of Pakistani involvement. This is what they're doing. Look what Pakistan is doing to us. the story ended there for the entire country for the rest of the world the story ended there 10 days after that happened this encounter happened on 24th of march 2000 and a few days after 10 days after five families from two villages panchaltan and patribal this all happened in the anantnag district 
Kashmir, the 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 then united Jammu and Kashmir, the single state. They stood up and said, "Hey, our boys are missing. Where is my son gone? Where is my nephew gone? Where is my father?" People started searching, and then it was not very hard for people to put two and two together. Five people missing from two villages, five people shot dead. So the family said, maybe these are our boys, our fathers, our parents, our children. Then protests started. People started gathering, holding marches and protests and things like that. And one of those marches was so big that the cops had to open fire on that march. Ten people were killed. the pressure on the jammu and kashmir government was intense enormous so they did what any good government would do they collected samples they exhumed the bodies of these five the five bodies were by, by the way they were never handed over to the families the security forces said we have buried them because they were charred beyond recognition they were burnt in the fire fight there is nothing left for you to see we did it over but after the intense protests after protests after protests after protests and the protests were going out of hand the jammu and kashmir government said all right we will do what you want what do you want the family said let's do some dna tests they said sure we'll do a dna test that once and for all will prove whether those who are dead are related to you or not so they collect they exhumed the bodies took samples from the bodies took samples from the families and they sent them off to a lab a month later in the assembly the then chief minister that was farooq abdullah they showed up a little document see this is what it is the lab says they don't match so these are not those missing five people and there he died i was with the times of india in hyderabad we had just launched times of india in hyderabad in 2000 this was in 2001 we were told we every every morning we we meet all the hods meet with the editor we have a discussion what's happening what's coming next what's to be is there something we can plan something we can talk about something we can write something do we do we need to investigate something sir editor said uh, i've been hearing things about the panchaltan and patribal encounters he says what apparently the dna tests were faked so it was up in the air and i'll show you a few pictures of what happened okay this this is this picture shows you all the images of the people who were killed in the gurdwara this is one of the, one of those old ladies mourning the loss of her son by the way many of the images you see here quite a few of them are things i picked up from the internet as part of a fair use policy i don't own copyright okay i'm not using them commercially i'm using them only for this purpose just as you can use any clip from any movie if you want to do less than 30 seconds so typically keep it to 23 22 they can't catch you more than that they'll catch you okay this was a story that rocked the nation there was a lot of lot of anger in kashmir the things were about to go out of hand and all those dna tests which the government did and it had all these things you see the story had terrorists the story at the army
the story had the police, the story had the politicians involved, the story had religion involved. The terrorists were Muslims, the victims were Sikhs. And then there was a US president. He, he couldn't get more pot boily than that, you know. If you want to write a movie story, you had everything here except the beautiful girl and the handsome boy. That's me being a bad slide maker. There he is, finally. Okay. It had everything going on for a fantastic story. And by the time Clinton arrived, it subsided. Soon after he left, it was buried. It was buried because the DNA test said nothing is connected. A year later, there we are in a small room of this size, 10 of us sitting in our office in Times of India, Hyderabad, talking about it. So the challenge was, how do we find out what exactly happened? The only way we could find out was to get an actual copy of the DNA test result. Getting a sample, getting a DNA test result copy in a case like this is next to impossible. No one's going to give it to you, yeah. even if you know which lab. Of course, we knew it's the CDFD, Center for DNA Fingerprinting and Diagnostics, which is in Hyderabad, which is the premier DNA testing lab in the uh, facility in the country. It trained so many people. Now there are offshoots. There's one more in Calcutta, but CDFD is the big boss. <clears throat> CDFD got the sample, CDFD did the test, CDFD sent the report, and that was the end of the story. And here we are in our office thinking uh, there is a conspiracy behind it. Let's crack it now. That's what journalists do. That's what we do. We take the pants off these people. Let's let's show them. Let's find out what it is. But it was easier said than done. We knew the lab, which lab did the testing. But you had to get a copy of the test report. And those days we didn't have these mobile phones with cameras. None of these were available. It was not like someone shows you, you take a quick picture and shove your phone back. No, not going to happen. They're not going to talk to you. Sir, what did we do? I was heading the city bureau then. I was, I was the metro bureau chief at Times of India at that point of time. CDFD is in the city. So I claimed the territory. So CDFD is my city. It's in, it falls in the city, so it's my thing. I'm going to get it done. I sent a reporter. I said, go find out. Ask if the director wants to talk to you. Okay. These are random pictures that are associated, related with that. We'll come to the real one later. And obviously, the director didn't want to talk to the reporter. I said, what Panchatan, what Patribal, I have no clue. The reporter came back. So this is what he says. I said, no, 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 they've done it here, so go back. So this reporter went back eight days, including a Saturday when he said, come back tomorrow. Even though it's a weekend, I'll be in the office. I'll see if I can find you some time. She went there at eight o'clock in the morning, sat outside his office till five o'clock till they shut it and the guards shoved, shoved her out of the building. Day eight is when the scientists there said, okay, now I know you're really serious about finding out what this is. You've been coming here, just sitting there, not even moving out to go get yourself a glass of water. I know you're serious about it. But he said, I'm not going to talk to you. I need somebody senior with you. This reporter had just joined. So I was the bureau chief. So next day we went. A lot of protests happened, like I said, right? And they exhumed the bodies. Remember this face. Okay, I'll come to it later. This happened. We wrote the story. We got a copy of that document. It was just shown for exactly five minutes. 
was shared with us for five minutes. In those five minutes, we took a piece of paper, we had a pencil with us, we made a true copy of that report. No Xerox, nothing. For plausible deniability, the scientist left the room. He, he, he told us, he said, hey, look, there are, there are these papers here. You shouldn't touch anything on my table, okay? I need to urgently go to the restroom. I'll come back in about five or ten minutes. Don't, don't, don't touch anything. But there are some really important documents here. Don't touch. Obviously, I, mean, I was going to touch. You know, I, I, I'm not going to leave it there, right? So I took it out and had a white piece of white paper, made a true copy. It had two pages, front and back, or rather front and back. What we realized was, when the Jammu and Kashmir government said, these samples do not match, they showed page one to the world. They did not show page two. The page two gave the reasons why the samples did not match. And the samples did not match because they wanted to cover it up. They wanted to prove that these fellows, five people who were killed, are not related to these families who are claiming that their boys and sons are missing. So let's take a guess, random guess. What do you think they would have done? Random guess. Exactly. That's exactly what they did. Typically, in cases like these, they take the maternal side of the blood. Paternity is always a question. Maternity is a certainty. Paternity can always be in doubt. There is no question on maternity. Who the mother is, there is no doubt. Who the father is, could be anyone. Science speaking. Okay. So they took samples and the samples were sent. Samples did not match. Page 2 told us why they did not match. They did not match because every of those five samples of the families they sent, they mixed them up with male blood. Where they said it belongs to some so-and-so begum, it was a man's blood. In one sample, there were three mixed. I have absolutely no clue who their advisor was. But they really did not have an idea that any lab scientist just looking in a drop of blood can tell you whether it's a male blood or a female blood within no time. It doesn't take long. I mean, not just looking at a blood, but you do whatever you need to do. But it's so, it's so simple these days. So page two gave the reasons why they did not match. We came back. We wrote the story. What happened? Why the families? Samples did not match with those of the dead. We didn't know. We, at that point of time, we still did not know whether they, those, the dead were the members of those families who were claiming. But what this did, what this did was restart a whole protest movement in Kashmir. This story went nationwide, obviously. This is big. This is huge in terms of journalism. This is one of the... I'm not saying this because I was involved with it. Okay. But this is one of the most significant pieces of journalism ever to emerge in Hydra, out of Hyderabad in the last 25 years. I'll bet my boots on that. Absolutely one of the finest pieces. 450 words. Not even 450. They're probably just about 350 words. That's it. All it took was 350 words, but a hell of a lot of hard work, patience. So what happened later is they did a re-exhumation of the bodies. They had to. This time scientists from CDFD went to collect the samples from the families. And sure enough, what was the result? They matched. It matched. Why am I telling you this story? It's just another news report. You know? Most of you were even too young to know that something like that happened. 
you know, we're talking about stories and takeaways. We'll come to the takeaway, why the story matters. There are lots of takeaways. I'm sure you understood some of them by now. I don't even have to spell those out. If somebody tells you journalism is painful, journalism doesn't pay, journalism is yuck. And I'm sold on journalism. I've been on journalism for a long time, so obviously I'll be biased. I like journalism because journalism does this. You can hold the most powerful in the country accountable with a mere 350 words that take less than 20 minutes to type. That's what a good story can do. Stories can hold people accountable. Good journalism holds. I'm going to stick to journalism. Okay, That's what, I, what little I know is from journalism. That's why these stories matter. All stories matter. Whatever kind of a story you read matters. There is a purpose for it. There is a purpose for it. There is hard work also. I didn't get to be where I am today just because, you know, because I have a silver, silver spoon or something like that. I got, I got where I am because I worked my butt off over all these years, whether academically or professionally. So anyway, this is what happened. This is, again, I'm repeating. I don't know if journalism students are here or not, but this is one of the most important pieces of journalism to emerge out of Hyderabad in the last three, since 2000, in the last three decades. That led to the destruction of a political party forever. National Conference never won an election again. The Indian Army was had to make the rounds of the court, Supreme Court, for 17 years. Policemen lost their jobs. And most importantly, there were five families which were outcast as Aapke Lalke terrorists hai, Abdur Raho Hamsi types. They got their honor back. They said our boys are innocent. They were picked up. You remember that face I showed you? That guy's name is Zahur Ahmad Dalal. He was 24 when he was picked up outside Anantanag. The others, I'll just run through the names. They're just names, but the people. One was Bashir Ahmad Bhatt, 22. Muhammad Yusuf Malik, Malik, 23. All of these were picked up in and around Anantanag. And then there was Juma Khan, a 42 year old laborer. And another Juma Khan. There were two Juma Khans who were picked up. They were both from another village called Branigan. Middle of the night. Imagine the terror you face. Imagine how outcast you feel of as a family. Much, much later, a few years down the line after I wrote this story, I met with an MLA, a CPI MLA from there, in Hyderabad. He used to represent Anantana. He was an MLA from there. Tarigami. So I met Yusuf Tarigami there in Hyderabad. He had come for something and uh, I just wanted to know how are things there now in uh, those villages, how are the families. See, we didn't follow up. As journalists, we didn't follow up. We wrote the story. We did one follow up after that about the lab, the second set of samples being sent to the lab and stuff like that. But the rest of the rest of the Times of India took over. The Kashmir Bureau of Times of India, the Delhi Bureau of Times of India, the Legal Bureau of Times of India took over the other aspects of following up what's happening in the Supreme Court, what's happening in Kashmir and things like that. We broke the story. We told the world this is what has happened. So Tarigami, when I met him, I introduced myself. I just said, I'm Balu. He just looked at me are you the Balu who wrote the story about DNA? I said, yes. He gave me a big hug. He gave me a big hug and he said, you have absolutely no idea what you people have done for those five families. That was all his concern was. You see, you gave them their honor back. Forget about cases being filed against those who killed and all that. You gave their honor back. Anytime you go to the village, you just go and say, I am Balu. Bacha bacha apka naam janta hai abhi. They'll carry you around on the village on their shoulders. I said, that's... 
really nice to know you know that was the for for us the outcome was finally five families were found to be innocent they got their respect back they could move around again but the takeaway was powerful can be held accountable it needs hard work it needs diligence and it needs a spine you need to have the courage to go ahead and write something or tell a story say i am going to stick my neck out no matter what kya hoga worst case scenario they'll sack me right i was also young i was 20 years younger then you know i was 22 years younger then. still had a lot of career we stuck then we stuck our neck out the other reporter was barely a month into the profession and she was your alum she was your j school alum journalism department alum so if anybody tells you kuch hone wala nahi hai journalism padh ke ya english padh ke likh ke kar ke they are all they don't know what they're talking about we'll talk about the kind of skills that you get later and then i'll tell you another story when 911 happened everybody knows 911 right anybody who hasn't heard of 911 please raise your hand here there's no shame in saying i don't know something okay the terror attack in the us on 911 now does it make sense the twin towers have were brought down and stuff like that when that happened the first two people to be arrested in that in connection with that event were hyderabadis nobody knew even we didn't know even we didn't know but as a team we started that we had this we, we had a wonderful team that would watch over each other all the time i keep a eye on your back you keep an eye on my back i know what you're doing today you know what i'm doing today so we we keeping our radars open we we have our eyes open we have our ears open so what happened after 911 was lot of people were missing lot of people were trying to contact each other their families were calling from hyderabad to new york saying i i want to know what happened to my son daughter bhanja beti damad whatever so the state secretary had opened a control room so if you have anybody living in that area near the twin towers or in new york and you're not able to get in touch with them please give us their names and your home addresses here and your phone numbers and we will through the uh, external affairs ministry we will try and get in touch with them because the phone lines were jammed phone lines were completely jammed so i sent one of my reporters to the secretary to say ja ke dekho kya ho raha hai wahan pe let us see how many people from hyderabad are actually worried about their families in new york he came back with a list of 18 names those were the 18 families which went and gave their information contact information at the uh, 911 control room so called control room at the state secretary typically newspapers go to bed we put newspapers to bed around 12:30 depending on the deadline depending on the number of copies you print we put it to bed that means everything is locked up the page is locked goes for printing our bedtime was midnight 11:55 our news editor who's checking one last time if there is something major something we have missed on ticker online suddenly called me and i was hanging around in the office i don't know why i was hanging around in the office that night but i was just hanging around in the office he said balu said, what's up and this names familiar one was ayub one was asmat i said mm, i don't remember why are they familiar he said yeah these two names are there in that list we got from this uh, control room so i said okay what is this news report the news report was a uh, feed from associated press a small little clip with two mug shots these were the mug shots they said these two people were arrested 
because they fit the profile of the bombers of the plane, planes that hit US, whether it's the Twin Towers, whether it's the Pentagon, whether it's something else, they've been arrested. The only thing we had were their names. Two similar names, two people, same names in our list of families which gave the information and one that comes from Fort Worth, Texas in a news report. We were about to go to bed. We called our editor and said, what do we do? These guys could be guys from Hyderabad. Immediately, he, he did what he had to do. He called the general, he woke up the general manager and said, we are not printing right now. All of this is happening at the same time when I'm trying, then I was the only one who was, who was the reporter in the office. So I started calling up all the other reporters. I said, everybody come back in the next 10 minutes, either you're in the office or you're fired. Don't come back tomorrow morning. Whoever could come quickly came, the others came. A little late, depending on the distance, but everybody came. Whoever was asked to come came, including the photographers and things like that. But the editor came rushing. I said, what do we do now? What do we do now? Oh my God. We stopped printing. The general manager was after us. Every 10 minutes we were getting a call saying, every 10 minutes late, my 5,000 copies come in the circulation. He's worried about his, his, his problem, you see. We said, no, we need an hour. So we sent off a team of people. We had the addresses, right? We just had to know if these two guys were the same. That's all we needed to know. If they were the same, we had a big story. If they were not the same, ah, okay. you know, it doesn't matter. So when my general manager comes, he will give everyone's hand. Okay, you know, it's a roast. He will give you won't get an increment next time. It's okay, you know. That's, that's actually the discussion we had. And uh, so we had the addresses. We had printouts. Fortunately, Associated Press also put out their mugshots. So we printed a half a dozen copies of these mugshots. Too late to find an office driver anywhere. So we pulled out a sports correspondent, we pulled out a business uh, business uh, editor, a sports editor, a photographer. So those two guys, those three guys became the drivers. So everybody else who was in the office, except me and the news editor, they split into three teams and they didn't know where to go. Old city, imagine finding an address in the old city 20 years ago. Even today, it's very hard to find an address. If you just go by 3 dash, 5 dash, 26 by, divided by 4, multiplied by 6, something like that. That's how our municipal numbers are, right? I mean, I'm stretching it, but it's not easy. Well, I knew a lot of cops for a long time because I was, for the longest of time, I was a crime reporter. So I called up the chairman or ACP or the DCP or the commissioner, whatever, whoever I could call, I called the inspector. I said, look, I don't know, three cars are reaching your police station in the next 10 minutes. I want three constables to go with them who know these areas. Here is the address. Yeh hai locality. Yeh mohalla hai. Yeh mohalla koi janta hai tumhare paas? Bulao. Driver ke saa gaadi mein bitha ke bhejo. Bas. That's all I want. I knew them well enough. I knew them long enough. I've been a crime reporter for a long time. So, I said, okay. We had only two addresses, but we had three cars. So we found two constables. They gave two constables. They both went. It just so happened. The miracle of Hyderabad's addresses, address system, you know. Two different names. It was just on one side of the house. Ekigali name. Either Yusuf Guda or either some other Guda. It was like that. So both cars reached the same place. Our people knocked on the door. And it's very, very hard. I, this is nothing about, I'm not making any comment about culture here. This is how it works in the field. Okay? We have to be respectful. We have to be sensible about people's sentiments, their way of life. Okay? In the old city, middle of the night, I just can't knock on a door and walk into a Muslim house. 
I have to respect their 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 practices. I have to respect what they do. Even otherwise, doesn't matter whose house it is. You don't go knock on somebody's door at twelve thirty and say, "I am a journalist." बात करो इंटरव्यू दोगे तुम मुझे नहीं होता है वैसा so one of our reporters there was only one girl in the office that day so she was sent job you go with this one talk to she went in ladki hai also didn't know how dangerous can she be she went in she was asking questions my editor was standing outside of the door on his mobile phone relaying the question relaying the answer to me i was working up i had a phone like this i was sitting on the computer right by then we already done two dummy stories two dummy pages one confirming that these two guys are from hyderabad and the other this is the regular paper so and then suddenly i hear a big yell from my editor say, yes you what hey yeah this fellow is from here only Yeah, yeah. Their family has identified the photograph. Oh, we'll go back. Oh, it's a touch screen thing, is it? Yes. Wow. Where did I go? Yeah, here we are. Okay. I did not know it was a touch screen. Fantastic. Good to know. You guys are technologically so far ahead. Uh, so he said, "Are you confirmed?" ठीक है आयुब कन्फर्म होता आज मत तो कन्फर्म होगा ही होगा एंड आई वॉज देयर आई वॉज टाइपिंग द स्टोरी एंड द अदर फोन कैप्ट रिंगिंग फ्रॉम द प्रिंटिंग प्रेस वन ओ क्लॉक हो गया वन टेन हो गया वन फिफ्टीन हो गया पेजेस नहीं जा रहे हैं इट्स अ सीरियस प्रॉब्लम इन न्यूज पेपर ऑफिस इफ प्रिंटिंग गोज हेवायर एवरीथिंग गोज हेवायर अ फाइव मिनट डील है वी सेंडिंग इट by the time it is printed it translates into a 40 minute delay every every bit time gets added on minute half a minute two minute minute half a minute two minutes and finally we said i just told them i said okay you tell me whatever you telling me the quotes whatever whatever information we have there we just said fired story ho gaya i said i'm firing the copy talk that was the only page that was waiting we went and next day we were the only ones in the entire country to have the story we were the only ones to have the entire country to have the story it was too late for other times of india editions also to pick it up okay what did this do what could have this story done for us increased the circulation in the city enormously but as people are talking about you know, my question was about what people what what did what did we get out of what did we learn about simple it was teamwork the editor who didn't even have to move a muscle decided he should you know he should he should be there so he takes responsibility taking responsibility if anything happens anything happens at all tomorrow if there is a fall out of this i am going to be taking the responsibility because i am the head of the paper i am going to be there for you and then sharing of knowledge what little we know whatever little bit i know you know that's why the news editor caught it the news editor didn't have to see the list but he get he gets to see everything we are filing we are talking about because he needs to know it's about keeping eyes open it's about being sharp and more than anything else it is about team work you we, you may be the most brilliant individual alone you can't do anything absolutely there is nothing you can do all by yourself right so this this story was all about teamwork the first story was all about diligence and hard work and you know not giving up it was about not giving up it doesn't matter what profession you are and what study you do you give up you're done i mean you might as well pack your bags go home save your money instead of paying it to the university right Yeah, this was a follow-up. 
And then the FBI guys started calling us because FBI saw the story online in the Times of India. FBI also had no clue that these boys were from Hyderabad. FBI came to know about it after they read about it in Times of India, which was very nice for us. We were walking around with our collars high up that day. <laughs> And the entire Hyderabad media scape were calling us. It's a miss, right? If you're a competitive, if in a world of competition, you miss a big news, your editor is going to ask you the next morning. Times of India had this story, and it's not just one. One, two, oh my God, the touch screen. Okay, I'm not going to talk. One, two, three, four. Six, seven, eight. Eight people working on that story. And you had no clue? Atme se koi ek bhi tumara dost nahi hai jo batayega tumko. This is what is happening. Hell is breaking loose in Hyderabad. FBI is going to land tomorrow morning. 9 11 happened there barely two days ago. It's about teamwork. There's a reason why I kind of picked stories I wanted to show you. For me, each of them represents something. It's not about saying how great a journalist I am or how great a journalist my team was. You know? The thing about journalism is, whatever I do, there's fantastic, maybe fantastic news at 6 o'clock in the morning. It loses some of its team by 10 a.m. By noon, people kind of start, ah, okay, I'll study it. And by 2 o'clock in the afternoon, it is ready. I'm only as good as my next story as a journalist. If I go and tell the world, saying, the same thing happens to every, you know, it, it's pretty much the same in every field. You've done today, you have coded something, you've written a great program for Google, you're working for Google or something. Whatever else chosen field of yours is, okay, na? it's done and dusted. What next? What's coming next? What keeps you inspired? What keeps you going, moving from one to the other? What keeps you moving from one to the other is if you love what you're doing, if you like what you're doing, if you think you hate what you're doing, find something else quickly. You're wasting your time, you're beating yourself up, you're destroying your own future when you're doing it. Okay, some of us do jobs, some of us have to do what we have to do to keep our body or soul together. I worked as a part-time waiter in a bar when I was studying in a college. I worked as an office boy riding a bicycle across the city, delivering letters from here and there. I also worked as a medical guy. I also worked in a prawn, prawn farm. I've done all kinds of things just to keep life going. But I wanted to be a journalist. So one way or the other, I wanted to see my name in print. And I became a journalist. <clears throat> my, my education had nothing to do with journalism, but I wanted to be a journalist. And I got to a journalist. Some other day, if we meet again, if you're interested, I'll tell you the story about how I became a journalist. It's far more interesting than all this. But we'll stick to this today. How can stories happen? I'll, I'll quickly run through it. I, I think we are running out of time. I'll quickly run through How, how do stories happen? Okay. This is one of the recent ones I wrote. I'm just showing examples of my own report, not because, again, disclaimer, I'm not trying to promote myself or anything, but I can I, I, I own responsibility. I can take responsibility for what to do, good or bad. One of these systems. This is so cool. You know? so, this, I'll tell you how, how, how new stories happen. It happens, they happen when you keep your eyes open. We'll, we'll, I'll keep repeating that. I'll keep coming to that eyes open, ears open, eyes open, ears open. You, know, you might ask me, does this fellow ever sleep? Yeah, I do. I can just sleep standing. Right here I can sleep standing. Thanks to the training I got when I was a medical rep with Glaxo Pharmaceuticals, traveling from village to village in a bus, you were so tired, you just have Fall asleep. So, what kicked this off was 
the state government has started this program palle pragati patana pragati i am sure all of you are aware of it most of you hopefully are aware of it you should know what is happening in your own state at least the big things that are happening big programs government programs and schemes we should know you never know it might even be a question in one of your group exams you know if you are if you are preparing for it so i was wondering where are they finding land for all these things they want to set up a park they want to set up a playground they want to set up you know where there is no if there is no graveyard in a village you need to create a graveyard it's important those are very very important necessary things for a society to have a graveyard is extremely important so is a health center so is a school so is an office for the local village or what you know local administration at that level so when i was trying to find out where all they they found land where they did not find land for all these things then i realized then i came to know that most of these places wherever they set up these facilities they were all in forest land because there's no other revenue land available anywhere revenue land is the government owned land which is not forest land the government pretty much do whatever it wants to do with that land they can sell it to you they can lease it out they can do whatever they want so somebody told me you know what they actually building a playground inside a forest because i was talking to people and then uh, i said where they said in the kaval tiger reserve i said what inside a tiger reserve they're building a playground and that it turned out to be that it, they were not only building it they were building it in the core area of the tiger reserve a core area is the inviolate area you cannot interfere there that is where the animals are secure you can do song dance drama anywhere outside that core area boundary but not inside the core area that's its inviolate space it's like your own private room once you're in a bedroom once you're in bed nobody disturbs you it's your space it's the animal space and they were building a sports complex in the core area of the tiger reserve this is how we find things again you connect the dots somebody is doing something you ask a question okay this requires what does it require the most two things money land does the government have money it will find it somewhere one way or the other it will find it can it find land no money can be borrowed land land can't be you can't add another 10000 acres to telangana overnight right it's not going to happen it's not something it's not available in a bank where you can come and add put it in your pocket there's only a finite amount of space that is available so we were looking i started looking at it then i came across the story again connecting the dots i'll tell you why connecting the dots is important as you move on hey obviously the very next day the national tiger conservation authority said what the hell you building playgrounds inside tiger reserve core areas they said nothing doing you got to stop so we pat ourselves on the back whenever we get some reaction and say yes you know and we kind of beat our chest like tarzan and say this in fact humne kiya hai ye to it's still there's a thrill you see when when you do some work when you do some work sincerely and when it pays off when the result comes in i have nothing i i didn't get a single penny i didn't get a cent of land but something good is going to come out of it. again we never when we write on issues like that we don't say don't build a playground no playgrounds are also equally important not maybe as important as a hospital or a graveyard in a village but they are also important we need to find alternates to do that that's all we are saying we are not saying don't build them and this was another story uh i'll very quickly run through it i write a lot on conservation i write a lot on tigers i am very seriously involved in tiger conservation as an individual sometimes i write protocols for uh tracking problem tigers yes is it something to do with your coming i <laughs> <laughs> uh, no 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 pulipaka is a small village somewhere in krishna district but no a lot of people call me that a lot of people say where puli carrot tiger what's happening to this <laughs> good one <laughs> 
probably probably my dad was adopted that's how we got pulipaka so i don't know much about that side of the clan that's that's the thing. if i knew i would tell you but i'll find out pulipaka shri ram chandra great knowledge yeah yeah i know but i don't know i'm sure we are related somewhere or the other you know wo kya bolte hai seven yeah seven degrees of Seven degrees of separation. Somewhere or the other, we 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 connect. You see, most of us get connections somewhere or the other. So I'll quickly run through. I read, like I said, I read about tigers. I have a lot of friends in the forest department. People who have uh, started their careers when I started my career, who are now calling the shots. I'm still not calling the shots. They call the shots, but they're still my friends. So I get to know a lot of things. So this was a tiger which was caught in a trap, wire trap, placed by a poacher. and it was really in a bad shape uh, its name was k4 they are given names k4 it was born in a forest beat area called kadamba kadamba beat so k4 kadamba k4 she was the fourth in the kadamba beat so k4 anyway what this did was they never cared about tigers this was in asifabad adilabad the old adilabad district which is now asifabad manchari area what this did was okay, i love tigers i i do anything for them but when i wrote the story what happened was that uh, they were forced to start acting and actually start doing to conserve tigers the more important thing was whether this tiger lives or dead is immaterial it's an individual animal conservation is always concerned with the species not with an individual individual of a species does not matter for conservation even when a time comes where to conserve humans they are not going to look at individuals they are going to look at species we see them in all those disaster movies right somebody gets picked randomly the boyfriend gets picked and the girlfriend gets left out or the baby gets picked and the mom is left out exactly what happens in wildlife conservation too individuals don't matter the species matters so what happened was there was a lot of work started in those two areas in those two districts which are actually the corridor areas for the tigers to move in from maharashtra into telangana that was the fallout of this 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 poor thing disappeared it's most likely died died two three years ago the construction was really really bad it was a steel cable imagine if if your normal waste is like this and then this is the waste you live with that's what happened to and then you find stories that are practically bollywoodish hollywoodish you know it's just a matter of again able being able to see how do you how do you get to see what the what the possibilities are that comes with a lot of reading lot of awareness about you, you read a lot you learn a lot you you figure out the moment you see something you say this has potential you do that all the time when you see an idea when you see an instagram picture when you see a youtube or when you studying when you a chapter or something you get an idea said this has more this is lot this more that can be done with this this was one such incident about 1 2 3 4 oh, 2018 okay that's this one 2018 there were floods kadam dam one gate was about to be blown out okay it it, it got jammed it was about to be blown off with the pressure of the water kadam dam has been the news again recently i hope you people follow news if you don't do i'm not saying read my paper but follow news learn what's happening around you in the world because that's what's going to that pretty much will decide what will happen to you in the days and months to come doesn't matter which newspaper you read you need to be aware you need to have some situational awareness about what is happening around you at a like micro level at a macro level and at a larger larger national level and maybe international level if you have the patience and the time so what happened was this happened and then there was this gate about to be blown off that was all the information we had and so somebody said oh, we all went and did some repairs i said barish ho raha hai andhera hai light nahi hai kichad hai pura road nahi hai राइट एट टन का गेट है 
what is battering you from there? How the hell did you do it? That was my question. There was no power, there was nothing. You couldn't even walk in that mud. Knee deep mud that is sucking your feet inside. So what do you do? It, it really turned out to be like one of those disaster movies that just about stopped at the very last minute. They had to drag their motorcycles through mud. They had to drag equipment through the mud, knee-deep mud. Somebody had to hold small torches. People had to tie themselves to each other so they didn't get washed away. And they managed to repair the stupid gate. Okay. It could have been a simple report saying, gate was damaged. It was repaired. I could have gone home in half an hour finishing that. I spent about three hours talking to people on the phone. I was in Hyderabad. They were all in Hyderabad, Nirmal. I spent about three hours talking to people on the phone, finding out each. Not every word that you talk gets into a news report, by the way, right? You don't want to, you will not read anything more than 450 words. Let me tell you that is scientifically proven. 400 words, your patients start waning. 450 words, you kind of pull yourself. Beyond that, you'll want to take an axe and find the fellow who wrote that thing. You, you, you want to butcher that chap. If he can't tell me the story, what it is in 300 words, why the hell is he even continuing with this? So 400, 450 words is a cut off. Typically. You won't read more than that. Nobody reads more than that. But don't tell that to your teachers. Okay, I'm talking about journalism, not about your textbooks and the papers you read and the chapters which are 30, 30 pages, 40 pages. Kind of I've been there as a PhD student, so I know. It's hell. You really want to sometimes. Yes, we'll talk about it some other time. So again, I'm just, uh, we'll come back to each of these stories very, very quickly. I just want to run through some interesting stuff I did and what I learned in that process about what is, what it is. Oh yeah, animals, by the way, make great subjects for storytelling. Okay, this is this is Susie, the chimpanzee in Hyderabad, at the Hyderabad Zoo. It was her birthday. So they, they strung some little fruits for it, for her, for her to enjoy and all that. But soon after that, Susie died of old age. By the way, I'm the only fellow only journalist in this country who writes obituaries for wild animals that die in the zoo. I think if an animal being in the zoo and a few lakh people would have interacted with it over their life, its lifetime, its story needs to be told. I believe in that. It's like, what would you talk about if you had a pet that passed away? You will talk about your pet, whether it's a cat or a dog or a fish, whatever it is. You talk about it. So I write obituaries for zoo animals which die. Okay? I find it very humbling to do that. And I find, I think I'm blessed that I'm able to do that. I tell stories about these creatures which nobody has heard of. So I write stuff like this too. And then you also write stuff like this. See, small things, insignificant things, what people might think are very, very normal, very, very common, are very extremely important. This happened during a quick thing with the OGH. Cell and sticks were not there, so people were getting branches and then stuck them up and usme se bags hang over. Yes. A hospital can't be like that, right? So we wrote a story about it. By next day, there were 50 new silent stands. They were being trundled, they were being dragged across everywhere. Tuck, 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 Which is good. Patient doesn't have to worry. Patient's already, patient is worried. The attenders are even more worried. You don't want to be searching for a branch, some, some stick somewhere, when your uncle is about to die because five minutes later, your injection will pani not What does this show? This shows how what we take for what we think is normal 
shouldn't be the normal should necessarily need not necessarily be the normal the normal is having a proper strength not this so this 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 kind of falls under public service you see it made a lot of news and everybody laughed at the ogh management health minister ye wo rajender was the health minister is a good friend of mine he called and said kya wala why do you do this I said hey, you do your job i don't have to do this you see we may be a friend we may be may know each other but doesn't mean that i'm going to stop doing my job just because you happen to be a friend and then you also find interesting stories from here and there the bjp had a big meeting here recently and somebody was talking about this woman from karimnagar coming and cooking the authentic telangana food for them i said i want to talk to her i want to talk to her and find out what she feels prime minister ke liye khana bana rahe ho yaar bar bar har kisi ko chance thodi milta hai pm ko khana bana bana ke khilane ka it's just a human interest story you see for her it's it's the crowning achievement of her life she never dreamt of it that's what she told me I mean, we get to do all these things as a journalist okay it's not always boring press conferences by the stenographer ke sa likho no we get to do a lot of things and we also get to do stories like this this is about my colleague is a crime reporter navin okay somebody lost a bicycle a fellow went and gave a complaint who cares right if somebody loses a bicycle वो भी घिसा पिटा जंग पकड़ा रस्ट है दो स्पोक्स नहीं है पहिए में एक में वी डिसाइडेड टू केयर अबाउट इट इफ अ मैन गोज टू पुलिस स्टेशन एंड लॉज अ कंप्लेन सेइंग दैट आई लॉस्ट माय बाइसिकल माय लाइफ डिपेंड्स ऑन इट वी सेड वी विल केयर अबाउट दैट मैन लाइफ एंड वी फॉलोड इट अप we followed it up with the police every day morning evening morning evening morning evening morning evening cycle mela cycle mela cycle mela cycle mela they got heartily sick of it then they found it out otherwise they wouldn't have bothered about it honestly they would not have bothered about it we forced them to look at cctv cameras our we we, we pestered them so much that they had to look at cctv camera yahan mein dikh gaya theek hai yahan se bike by somebody was dragging it away yahan se next camera kidhar jata bhai pakdo dhoondo that this din laga took about a week to thin this but by god that man got his bike back he got his bicycle back after he got his bicycle back we thought we should go and talk to him and write about it we get to do these things It's very exciting you know people might not think kya yaar cycle to bahut cycle ghumte hai no who even rides a bicycle these days anyway we decided to care we said no we will care for the smallest of the small people those who have a telephone those who have access we will st- we can call friends family whatever it is we can exert some influence we can exert some uh, whatever else we can exert and get our things done but the poor the small cannot do it they don't have a voice they don't have the access we said we will bat for those people I was heading the metro. I was the metro editor when we did that story. I hadn't moved to the political department yet. Oh, by the way, a lot of people ask me when I started journalism. So I keep telling them that I started very young, calling up my sources. <laughs> But uh, you know, that wasn't the case. I, I started writing when I was in my uh, intermediate. So I started writing freelance. I wanted to see my name in print. So I would write articles and send them to different newspapers. Two, two, one, two. Yeah, two of them got published before I became a journalist. One in Deccan Chronicle, one in News Time. News Time used to be owned by E. Nadu long, long back. <clears throat> See, when you have a lot of information, what happens? It can be very, very confusing. Completely confusing. You have to find. you have to get to the core of it exactly what you do when you study a paper exactly when you do when you are studying your textbook right that's what we do you go to the core of the issue and you find your answer so 
lot of confusion when we see information there is enormous amount of confusion trust me each of those little stories didn't happen just like that it takes 4 5 6 hours of hard work before we write those 250 300 400 words you don't want confusion right yeah i definitely don't want to be there i don't know if it is asia or africa we are talking about So what do I do? I read. I read a lot. I've always read a lot. I read a lot. Not as an obsessively reading, but I read. I read a lot, and I love Calvin and Hobbes strip. So that's why they're there. And you notice things once you start doing it. You notice things. I'll tell you two small tricks you can do. Anybody can do. Okay. You notice things when you're going by. This is on the Khatabat flyover. They have a nice little painting where there is there is a scuba, not even scuba diver. What, what is the other diver called? Deep sea diving. Deep sea diving. Thank you. The deep sea diving where they have the lead lead shoe, lead weight shoes and all that. So they have deep sea diving. They have sharks. They have some fishers and all that. I couldn't resist taking a picture. See, so, yeah, this is what Hyderabad is going to be like if we flood, get flooded. Huh? GHMC has already warned you. Don't blame them. They have put it out right there on the Saipoka Kartavath flyover. It's there. You haven't seen it. It's your problem, not their problem anymore. And when you see, you also see. Sometimes you see the pathos. You see the trouble. This was at the peak of the black fungus fear we had. I went to the ENT hospital, which was the which was the nodal area for black fungus cases, Kochi ENT hospital. I went to talk to the doctors, and uh, <clears throat> I saw this uh, man sitting there with his old woman. You can't see it very, very clearly, but I can describe it. Her nose was black; it was, it was blocked. Her eyes were black. It was the black fungus. Okay. She could barely breathe. Her mouth was black, and. the doctors did not know what to do they knew she was dying there was no way out she was dying there was no way that she could have survived she was far too gone the choice was of getting a bed do i give a bed to somebody who we know is certainly going to die do i give a bed to somebody who has a chance of living that's what army doctors do in the field by the way okay they are very brutal when it comes to it that fellow will just run around those injured in the field and he say uh, no 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 yes pick them up and go these guys are far too gone just give them painkillers and go morphine injection they don't nickel hands at least the person doesn't know the pain as he is dying doctors face this moral dilemma ethical dilemmas all the time where do i where do i spend my time and energies on do i save somebody who has a chance or do i fight with somebody try to save somebody who we know has absolutely no chance the person is going to die we learn a lot i learn a lot when i go and I, this conflict what is important it's a very complex question and we all have to find our own answers there's no single answer to it. It, it all boils down to what we have learned, how we have been brought up, what our values are. A doctor's values are very, very simple. I have to save a life of a person whom I can save. Simple. He or she makes a choice. It just accidentally happened. I was walking by, and there was this person sitting there, and I just suddenly, "Am I in the?" And the itlet lines are, itlet lines are, mama sir, nin raat nin chochnam sir, tis kotlet sir lokat. So I went and asked the doctor, "Sir, what happened, boy?" So the doctor said. So she is dying. What can I do? He doesn't understand. I said, obviously, he doesn't understand. He is she is his mother. He is not as well educated as you or me. You know, I am not saying I am well educated, but you certainly are. You are a doctor. So there is a way of you telling him, or at least make them comfortable. You know, put them somewhere. Let them. Let them. You know, कुछ भी नहीं है तो at least get a cot or something. Put it under the tree where they can rest. Do something. Of course, they did later, but she passed away. But this was in the afternoon, but night when I went and checked, she she had passed away. 
So again, keep your eyes open. For me as a journalist, this was a fantastic story. As a story goes, this was fantastic. But it also highlighted the crisis that was going on. Okay. And then we come across things like this. This is latest. This was published yesterday. Again, one of my colleagues. We had this monkeypox care. I'm sure all of you know there was a suspected case of monkeypox from Kamaredi and all that. Anyway, it so turned out he doesn't have monkeypox. It is something else. Right? But what they did was they stuck him into a PPE kit. Any doctor knows that if you have any kind of a pox, the first thing is you should let the body breathe air. So you wear nice, loose-fitting clothes, simple, lightweight cotton, and keep the person separate, isolated. That's what the quarantine hospital is for. That's what the fever, Ronald Ross Institute is for, what we call fever or quarantine hospital, right? Quarantine is nothing but corrupted quarantine hospital. So, <clears throat> just like Raja Mahendravaram became Raja Mandri, quarantine became quarantine. <clears throat> so we found this, we found this out because our photographer managed to sneak in and get a picture of this patient. And when I looked at it, I was, I was actually on sick leave, I was running around hospitals with a back pain myself. When I saw this picture, I called the reporter and said, hey, have you seen the photograph? Find out if a patient like this with pox should be in a PPE kit. PPE kit is unbreathable, it, it doesn't breathe, you'll sweat. You would have seen a lot of pictures during peak of COVID, how doctors were having those rubber ma marks all over their body and sweat. And when they take their PPE kit out, they're just drenched inside. That's the last thing you want a pox patient to be having, drenched in sweat. So we wrote the story. Today morning, last night, it was discovered that he didn't have uh, monkey pox. And this morning, our photographer took another picture. I didn't have the time to get it in. He was, way, he was made to wear, uh, uh, yes, scrubs. He was given a pair of scrubs to wear. He said, ah, fine, good. At least we got this man out of the PPE kit. Yeah. Uh, and work takes us to all kinds of places. If you're a journalist, you get to know go to all kinds of places. Uh, that was in some ruins in a forest. This was in a tunnel, one of the Kaleshwaram project underground tunnels when it was being constructed. And sometimes you see, you, you have no other place you have to write, what do you do? Somebody who was passing by took a picture and then asked me, tapped me on my shoulder and said, sir, 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 aapka number dijiye, I just took a photograph of you. This was at a Rahul Gandhi public meeting. I had to stand and take notes and there was nothing, there was a fire engine which just came in there. So I said, ah, this looks perfect, like a table. You, know, you sit and do wherever you have to do. News gathering doesn't uh, give you the luxury of uh, uh, ideal working conditions. Reporting doesn't, never gives you the ideal working conditions. Okay, so what are the takeaways? Okay. What, 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 what are the takeaways? They're very, very simple. Okay. Attention to detail. Right. Attention to detail is important. And then you stay cool under pressure. You have to stay cool under pressure. You're trying to tell the world something you've come to know and which you think people need to know. See, I don't have to educate people. That's not the role of a journalist. That's not what we are here for. That's not what I am here for. I am here to do my best to inform people on things I believe they need to be informed about. That will impact their life, either directly or indirectly, or make them think about the society they are living in. I am not here to reform anybody. But if they notice something the next time, maybe they will help that man without a voice, that bicycle man, old man with a man who lives in a one room tin room uh, one tin roof tin room house with two children and a wife and who survives on his bicycle okay and we work under deadlines i told you the story about uh, the 911 suspect ayub and azman we were under tremendous pressure trust me 
if you were to check the blood pressure of a journalist at 8 p.m., you would probably want to drag that person straight, put him into an ICU or hire her into an ICU. You say, you're going to die like this. That's the kind of a pressure we face. Okay. That's pretty much like how it is for us at the end of the day. You know? What mood is that? We are snapping at each other sometimes in the office. Fire, 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 fire. Little fireworks go off. And what is this story doing here? It is because attention to detail. Okay? This is something I did just a few days ago. <coughs> About 320 words, or 270 words, or something like that. 244 page report. It's a 244 page report on the state of farmers and their finances in Telangana. I had to distill everything down into one simple point that people will understand. One thing that will tell the people who read the story the plight of the farmer in the state. I have nothing against the government. I just do my job. Everybody hates me equally, by the way. The government hates me, the BJP hates me, the Congress hates me. Everybody hates me. That means I'm doing my job right. So the whole point is, if I pay the attention to detail, this, this little line about 2.5 lakh farmers, bank accounts have turned into non-performing assets, which means they will never again in their life get a loan. Never again. From any bank, any kind of a loan. Let alone a farm loan. It's significant. It is important. You have taken a whole chunk of farmers out of the banking system. You have forced them to depend on money lenders who will completely suck their blood and let them die. It was a 245 page report, but I had to go through it very, very quickly within a couple of hours to find what I can find. Attention to detail comes with practice. You do it, you do it, you do it, you see a lot of things as you go along. But this was the only takeaway for me from that 244-page report. There were a lot of other things, but this was the most important thing to me. And that's why I included this story here. Attention to detail. You pay attention to detail, you will find that little diamond that has been tucked, that's tucked away somewhere. You will find that. When you do that, let's say you're taking an exam, you write that answer, you'll see the difference between the marks you score and somebody else scores. All teachers are not dumb. They know exactly what we are doing. OK, this is the big picture. Everybody wants media to be the watchdog. Right? That's, that's the classical role of the media, watchdog. You keep a watch. If somebody comes, you bark. And you say, this is going wrong, that is going wrong, which is pretty much said. This, this is pretty much true, you see. The B type is the kind of a watchdog everybody wants. The A type is the one nobody wants. And the A types is the kind, we, the kind of a watch that we want to be. It's not always easy. Let's face it. There are times when uh, we have to shut down. We have to tone down what we write. We have to do that. Everybody has to do that. Everybody does it. Everybody does it. But within those limitations, we still do a lot. So this is what this is what we do week after week after week after week. We do a little watchdog kind of a thing on the civic administration. We give a voice to the people in the King Chronicle. They can they send us pictures. They can they send us little write-ups about their problems, and then we follow up on them. Not every one of them can be. We cannot follow up on every one of them, but we follow up on quite a few of them. Okay, this is what everybody thinks media is managed and all that. This is our, you know, it's not always necessarily the case. If somebody tells you the entire media is managed, they don't know what they're talking about. They absolutely have no clue what they're talking about. And if somebody tells you, ah, communication, kya hai, kuch nahi hai, why do you want to learn English, why do you want to do this, why do you want to get a journalism and all that, it's a pain. Let me tell you something. What has journalism taught me? What were my takeaways? The takeaways can be different to each 
for each one of us, you see. It depends on our background, depends on our aptitude and pursue, uh, how much interest we have. For me, it taught me how to stay cool under pressure. No matter what the situation is. I, I might snap at my colleagues, but it's cool. Because we have to be cool. Otherwise, we can't think straight. The more mm. under pressure, the straighter you can think, the more successful you are. Because you're focused. You're not getting distracted by your anger and irritation. It comes with a lot of practice. It comes with a lot of sacrifice. And then you learn attention to detail. The little things might matter. Small little things matter. If you're writing on a crime, if I'm reporting on a crime, it matters to me. It matters to me what time the crime happened. It matters to me what the police did to investigate. It matters to me why, what the DNA report said. That I question, how can a DNA report, how many pages does a DNA report have? That was the first question we actually asked ourselves that day. They showed one page. How many, how many pages are there in a DNA test report? There are five families. Eh? That means each family has to be cross-matched with five samples of the dead, five of the dead. That means we have 25 sets of tests. All of that fit into one page? That was the first question we asked ourselves. Then we said, they can't be right. There must be something more to it. So you, you pay attention to detail. And then we make complex information how to make complex information more understandable. Any kind of a communication, any kind of a language you learn, this is what it teaches you. Making complex information more understandable, like that farmer story I told you about. right? And then we learn how to meet deadlines under pressure, day after day after day after day after day, we do that. And we are able to explain things without meandering all over the place. At least I don't do it when writing, maybe during speaking I do. When I write, I don't meander. I go straight. And what does it do at the society at the larger level? For These are the individual takeaways. For it doesn't matter who it is, what kind of communication you are on. At a larger level, it's the watchdog function. The most primary important function that media does is watchdog. Stories, that's what stories do. Stories hold the powerful accountable. And then we, it can be a voice for the voiceless. Like the bicycle man who lost his bicycle. He didn't have money. My reporter was in tears when he came back. He said he insisted on going out and buying a piece of some sweet for my reporter. He said, Aap log padi isle mera bicycle mein cycle mein gaya mera. Makes you feel, you know, that it's a life worth living. See, it doesn't necessarily have to be a five star banquet and a big dance or a or an award, you see. Something simple like this can make a lot of difference. Makes you feel good about yourself. Makes you want to do something more. And at a societal level, at a larger level, you become the voice for the voiceless. You inform people about things that we think they should know. And if they think they don't need to know, they have, by, believe me, they have no problems in conveying it to us. We get all kinds of messages. Emails and stuff like that. Why the hell are you wasting my time with this report in the paper? With a lot of expletives also. We Hyderabadis are very free with expletives. You know? Mom, dad, brother, sister, bhanja, everything gets dumped at us quite often. We take it as a feedback. And uh, yeah, well, that's about it. Any questions? I took a long time. I'm sorry. I don't know how much. Yeah, I think way, went way beyond my time. I'm very, very sorry about that. But uh, I get excited when I talk about journalism. That's actually a, a long story. But uh, well, I'll quickly tell you in three sentences if I have your permission. Just two minutes. My father was a Telugu teacher. I'm the elder of two siblings. My father desperately wanted me to learn English. He thought English is the future. Telugu has no future. And he used to buy a newspaper every Sunday, Indian Express, when I was a kid. So one day I saw a name. It said A. Balu in Washington. 
I went around the house running around like a madcap, saying, my name has been printed. My name has been printed. So my dad said, no, 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 it's not your name. You are P. Balu, that is A. Balu. I said, no, Balu is Balu. No, what difference does it make? He said, no, 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 no. A makes a difference, P makes a difference. You are a P. Balu, that's A. Balu. So I said, what do I do? He wanted me to learn English, right? That's why he was buying that newspaper. Dekhega, cartoons, dekhega, thoda interstand. He said, you must learn English. He was a damn good teacher, by the way. I'm sure he must have been. He, he latched onto that opportunity. And, that told me. and then he told me something. He cheated me. He really, really cheated me. He was such a cheat, my father. He said, do you know Washington is in the US? I said, yes. I was, what, 11, I think, then. Okay. This happened when I was 11. And do you know that even beggars in America speak in English? I said, wow. Oh my goodness me. I don't know how to speak English. I don't know how to speak English. I don't know how to speak English. I don't know how to English. I don't know how to speak English. I said, oh my God. I said, I have to learn. I said, what do I do? I said, I'll start a drill. Believe me, I read like a mad cap. I read anything and everything and anything and everything. I could read in English. My father passed away when I, when I was 13. And uh, much later, a few years later, as you grow up, you realize you learn about things, right? One day it suddenly hit me. I said, what the hell? Everybody in the US speaks in English. This man cheated me. <laughs> yeah. this, this, was, this was wrong. A father should never cheat a son or a daughter like that. But uh, that's what got me going. And someday I wanted to see my, uh, that's the shot of the long story. I wanted to see my name in print. And uh, I got into journalism. I pestered the life out of an editor for 18 months. 18 applications I gave, one month after month after month. On the 19th month, he just gave it. Enough, come take a test. So he gave me a test, I got a job. This was in 1988. I started the News Time, which was uh, owned by Inadu. Inadu used to run a very, very good English newspaper called the News Time those days. I started with News Time. That's how I got into journalism, and I find it very, very exciting. I find it very interesting. After all these years, I still think uh, when I go to work, I feel like it's my first day at work. I haven't lost the sense of wonder. If I lost the sense of wonder, we wouldn't have seen some of those stories, you see. And I think it's very, very important that we all maintain that sense of wonder. We should not get jaded with what we know. There is always something else. Every time I see a green leaf, it makes me wonder, why is it green and not red? If you need to have the child in you, you want to be a good student, you want to be a good scholar, you want to be good at whatever, you need to have the child in you. Don't let the child die. No matter what, don't let that child in you die. Imagine, remember all those wonderful times you were trying to explore, find out things? You broke open a lock or something to find a clock to find out how it works and the dad came and gave one tight slap. But, you know, that's what it's and That's how I got into journalism. Sir, so what was the pressure on you when you broke the story of Jammu and Kashmir? Oh, enormously. We, we got calls from uh, Jammu and Kashmir police. We got calls from somebody claiming they were from the army. And they said, uh, how dare you write stuff like this? This was one conversation I received. You will be You have been exposed. You are finished. It's not going to save you. You do something to me or my reporter, it's not going to do anything to you. You you finished anyway. We do get some times. But most of the time, see, the thing about the media is if you have a secret, if you have a weak story, if you hold it to yourself, you are vulnerable. If it's once out in the public, it's a different story altogether. But uh, it doesn't happen all the time. The stakes were very, very high at that. You see, there was the army involved, army got insulted. Faruk Abdullah was the ego, very man with a large ego. We, we practically stripped him naked in public. So, 
Bidit gak tak sini. Blowbacks. Nah, nah, nah. We were geared up. We were geared up. I enjoy what I do, so I don't feel stressed. <laughs> oh, honestly, I, I really enjoy what I do. I love what I do. I think there is an idiot sitting somewhere on the fifth floor in my building, paying me at the end of the month to go and have fun. <laughs> I enjoy what I do. Sir. I really do enjoy. I feel if there's stress sometimes, sometimes I go into the jungle for a day or two and time. I take a break. Yes. I'll break it down into two parts, your question. Okay. One is, are you doing the job because you need a job to keep your body and soul together, to put some food on your table and that of your family? That will determine much of how you're going to fall in line or not fall in line. Okay. That's part one part. That's how, one, that's how people approach a job. A lot of us approach a job like that because you desperately need an earn making, earning something to keep yourself going. That's fine. When it comes to the intellectual part of it, whether you subscribe to the point of view of your owners or the management, you fall in line. It is their paper. It is their point of view. They believe in something. Had you been a reporter when N. Ram was the editor for The Hindu, you would be a left-leaning reporter today. Right? Enram is very leftish. Sorry, leftish. So, Enram is very leftish. So, how do you, you make a compromise? But within that, within that, you will always find room to tell the stories you want to tell. See, it's it's a navigation. It's a, it's it's a way of navigating. You you learn, but if if you have an open mind, if you don't have an open mind, you say nah, then you're finished. There's no hope for you. You as in you know whoever is there in that kind of a situation, there's there's there's, there's no hope because you're at constantly loggerheads. So you're always watching over your shoulders. Go na piche se kono bhi dekha kya bol raha hai. Yesterday I got into an argument with him. So he said I won't write this or I won't write that. What happens? Does that answer your question? Yes. Okay. So, sir, if we live in a country where there is a story in every street mm -hmm. or in any place, yeah. So, how much big or small a part does literature play in selecting which story to tell and which ones to ignore? Which ones worth pursuing and which ones not? Okay. Let, let, let me answer it this way. Every story needs to be told. Okay? Every story needs to be told. There is a limitation of space, especially when it comes to print. There's only so many stories I can tell over so many pages. Right? And then there is this huge, humongous happenings that have to be informed to the people. Though everybody says, Aajkal TV hai, kon dekhta hai, paper kon padta hai, that I love, do, do, do. But paper, newspaper is still the medium of choice when it comes to reliability. <clears throat> when you want reliable news, you turn to print. So there's a, space is always a concern. When I, 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 I can only tell you about print, okay? Print is where my expertise lies. Or my experience lies, not expertise. I'm sorry about the word. My experience lies. So, uh, what do, how do we pick what to tell? We go by the gut and experience. You know what 
see over a period of time you have you've seen life you you you've seen the world you've seen the country you've seen the state you've seen the people you you develop a sense of what matters to them what are the things that are important or what are the things that will provide them a little bit of a relief on a really terrible day heartwarming the bicycle story was a heartwarming story you know Yes. You have, you have, you that story. Yes. Why? Because it was, uh, it was a completely uh, different kind of a complaint. One, a bicycle. What does a bicycle, for me, what does a bicycle represent? A bicycle represents a person who cannot afford a scooter. Unless you are down and out in your life, why will you ride a bicycle? Tell me that. My father rode a bicycle all his life. All his life, he was a school teacher. He he went to a bicycle from Medipur to Amberpet. He went to a, on a bicycle every day. Uh, that because he wanted to save a few pennies for the kids, so he could put me in a private school and where I would learn English. That was his dream. But why would anybody want to ride a bicycle unless you are a fitness freak living on the west side of the city? You know, uh, you ride a bicycle because you have no option. You can't afford a scooter. You can't afford a 50 cc, 100 cc TVS moped. So you are, you are down. You are out. So we said, let us find out if the city police is up to the task of helping somebody who is really down and out. A rich person goes and gives a complaint. The complaint gets solved. Will the same thing happen, or can we make it happen for a really, really poor man? That's why we went after it. So a continuation to it, sorry to disturb you. Uh, the digital news thing has come up, right? Like it's the prominent field now where people go to news, right, sir? The problem with it is you have uh, like the pressure with print media, but the print, uh, the digital media has like double pressure with that because every two hours or one hour you get a news and then you gotta work on it and then. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. How like how how diff like uh, how pressurizing would uh, like how would you compare both the uh, both the working styles? Because I have no clue. I have no clue. I haven't worked in digital media, but I suppose the pressure cycles are shorter. The pressure cycles are shorter, and the relief cycle is also quicker. You find out, put it on TV. You're done. I don't do immediate follow-up or anything like that. I move on to something else. I have friends in the... I can only talk about television media. Okay? I have friends in the television media who say, they, they are live here, they have a video. After this, I don't have to do anything. It's for the editors to deal with it. So that's what happens. I think we are shot. We have overshot a lot by a long, long way. I think I'll wind it up here. Thank you so much. Very, very kind of you to have listened to me patiently. I hope it was of some interest to you. Uh, if it has been, then I consider myself lucky. If it hasn't been, I'm not responsible for inflicting myself on you. It is dead.